All right. Should we commence? Uh, I'm going to turn down my mic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on our webinar. And Mark Riley. Well, here we go. Let me see if I can do this. Can folks see this? All right. So, guys, here's what we're doing. Um, well, hopefully that looks even a little better. Um, we've had year after year where uh, we have the same bunch of folks going into Oshkosh and having a great time uh, flying our velocities in, parking together on Velocity Row, and basically doing what we do over and over, and we love it. The idea was um, there, there were probably others who were finishing their planes, getting to the point where they feel experienced or, or ready to get into the uh, air show in their own plane. We wanted to put together a little thing so that they would feel more comfortable doing so and, and try and give them a glimpse of what it's like to bring your own plane to the show, uh, to fly in, and to take part on Velocity Row with the bunch. So with that in mind, um, why fly your Velocity there? Uh, first off, obviously, most of us who built our planes, or even uh, those who bought planes and have taken the time to get to know them and learn to fly them, uh, it's a lifetime achievement when you fly your plane into Oshkosh. Um, really, if you talk to anybody who's done it, there's nothing that compares to it. It is a life moment that you'll never forget. Um, I thought it was one of the greatest things I ever did when I spent all the years on each plane, um, finishing the plane, taking it to Oshkosh, seeing Oshkosh from my velocity for the first time, flying in and landing there. You have that moment where you're, you're on finally, you've done it, you've made it, nothing can go wrong now. You land and uh, you pop the canopy in and uh, taxi in, looking out the door, there are thousands of people looking at you and you're looking at them and you get a whole new perspective. In short, it's just loads of fun. Um, moreover, you get to share it with the people who most appreciate it and uh, what it took to build your velocity. You'll get plenty of people coming by your plane, and by plenty, I mean hundreds or thousands, believe it or not, during the course of the week. But the ones who matter are at Oshkosh, and by that I mean other builders, other velocity pilots, because people, uh, the civilians, if you will, will look at the plane and go, wow, that's really pretty, cool plane. But they won't get it um, to the extent that another velocity builder or pilot will, particularly a builder. They'll look at it, and you'll see people pouring through your plane, complimenting you on this little latch or your finish on this or your instrument presentation, your upholstery, whatever, all the little details that make your plane unique. Um, plus, if you're, if you're uh, at Oshkosh, you're never going to see that many velocities anywhere else ever in the world. Uh, it's tremendous. Um, that having been said, there are only so many, many velocities at Oshkosh every year. I think the most I've ever seen there is 12 or 13. And there are lots of us out here. So we've always wondered, why not come in? Um, because again, it's tremendous to fly your plane in. And not only that, the Velocity people, it's, it's a fun, adventurous crowd of, of people who are just diverse and yet they all share something. We've all gone through this process and we built these planes and flown them. And you've got a bunch of people with a really unique skill set and a lot of common experiences to share. Um, and when I say flying in with your friends to be with your friends, it doesn't have to start when you're on the field at Oshkosh. Several times we've flown in uh, in a loose formation with friends over the lake. Um, the last time we did so with, was uh, with Bill Batten. We flew over to Andy's house, stopped off. We had several velocities gather and have a little snack, and then we flew over the lake together. It was amazing. Um, you can't really appreciate what your plane looks like or what a velocity looks like in flight unless you've done this, really. Um, just floated there off the wing of another plane. It's an easy flight over the lake together. We had a great time. And when you get there, um, I've always said, you know, we've got to get more people into this because you look at this, this view that I'm showing you right now, just a forest of winglets. It's beautiful. It's moving. Um, and again, you're going to see so many different velocities with um, so many little variations and so many great features. I've upgraded mine a number of times because I've saw, uh, seen so many great ideas on other people's planes. And frankly, you take them. So what we're going to do is talk about the practical. Um, if you're thinking about going now uh, or for the first time, great. We'll, we'll be talking about some of the, the basics. If you've been a number of times uh, or even one time and you're, you want to sort of up your game and find out how to do it better, faster, um, we're going to talk about that too. So we're going to start off now with the sorts of things you should be doing for your long-range planning now if you're headed to Oshkosh and your velocity. First off, housing. You're going to have to stay somewhere. 
There are lots of options at Oshkosh, and we've tried them all. Um, just for perspective, uh, I've been going, I think this will be my 30th trip to Oshkosh and my ninth in my own velocity. And we've stayed in just about every option. Uh, started out camping. Um, Andy, Rife, and some of the others camp every year and they love it. And there's a community of uh, velocity people that basically stays pretty much together and, and they've <clears throat> become closer and closer friends over the years, sharing that experience. We stop by and, and have a snack and visit. Um, but Camping is a great option if you really want to immerse yourself in Oshkosh and you don't have to leave the field during the course of the week. Anything you could possibly need is there. Um, there are trams that take you from uh, the campground back to the show area, back to Velocity Row, wherever you want to go. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about getting yourself oriented at the show and getting around in a bit when we get into the details. Hotels. Um, surprisingly, you can get hotel rooms. Um, I don't know if you can still get them uh, very close to Oshkosh right now, but we've stayed, for instance, in Appleton and nearby. Um, some people may like it. The plus side of, of the hotel is obviously you get your very own air-conditioned room, which on a hot year can be a big thing. You get your own nice clean shower, towels, sometimes a pool. The downside we found is twofold. First off, um, you're going to have a drive. Um, you're going to have to drive probably from Appleton. Might be 20, 30 more minutes in traffic. And we found, believe it or not, that the energy isn't the same if you're staying in a hotel. We had uh, long-haul truckers staying there. We had, uh, the year we were there, a sanitation crew that was servicing the, uh, the port a at Oshkosh stayed at our hotel with their trucks, which is really fragrant. Um, so I, I didn't, for us, I didn't think the hotel thing was it. We've also stayed in local homes. In Oshkosh, uh, all the local people open their homes up, and you can get it through EA housing links on the uh, site. There are also uh, some other uh, housing, uh, I'm going to say businesses, that will help you arrange it. Uh, and there are different ways you can do that. You can rent a house outright so that it's just you and your group and the owners vacate. I haven't done that, but I know a number of people do it every year and have a great time. Um, you can also just rent a room or rooms in a house. And we've done that where the people literally just give you a key to their house. Uh, you come and go as you please. Uh, typically, at the ones we've stayed, they provide you with breakfast. So it's like a sort of B&B &B experience. Um, we had a good time doing that. But for us, again, um, it worked. But it wasn't the best fit because I felt a little awkward being in somebody else's house with another family. Um, you'd be in the TV room and the family was there. Uh, it's, it's inexpensive. It's convenient. But it wasn't really for us because you also needed a car to get around unless you want to walk to a bus stop. Um, we finally settled on the last option I'm going to discuss, which is the dorms. Um, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh has uh, a large campus in Oshkosh. Uh, they open the dormitories up for uh, housing for air venture attendees. We found this to be the best option for us, and I'm a big booster of it because I think um, it, it's a terrific option. When you stay at the dorms, you basically uh, check in and you get uh, a package with your sheets, your towels, a pillow, a washcloth, a cup, and a bar of soap. You go up to your room and it's your standard college layout where you have uh, a door to the cinder block room. You've got two wardrobes, you've got two desks, you've got two beds. You have a refrigerator. That's all that's in the room. You, you can rearrange the furniture any way you want. Um, and then you have, uh, by floor, you have a men's room and a women's room, and they have common showers. So the advantage is you have a bed to sleep in as opposed to camping. You have your own room with your own key. Um, you have nice hot showers and uh, a, a bathroom. Um, I would say the biggest downside of the dorm is if it's a hot year, you're going to be hot. Uh, they're big stone buildings, and it can get very warm in the dorms. You can get an air-conditioned room, but the uh, air-conditioned rooms are almost double. I believe we're paying um, $75 a night for an unair conditioned room. I think it's $125 for the air-conditioned dorm rooms. So if it's a really hot uh, year, in retrospect, it might be worth it. But when I started adding the uh, $50 per room per night, multiplying by the number of nights there, I decided I didn't care that much. And again, what we do is on our first day there, we'll hit the local Walmart or its equivalent. We'll buy $16 box fans. And we leave them there when we leave. Um, we get one for each person, and we're, we're fairly comfortable. The other good things about the dorms, um, they have Blackhawk uh, Dining Hall right across from your dorm. And you can go over and get a, a cafeteria breakfast. I think it was $7.50 for all you can eat. And then when you're done with breakfast, you walk to the outside of the, uh, the uh, dining hall. 
and uh, City Bus uh, comes by every 15 minutes to pick you up. The great thing is the City Bus is a $1.50 round trip, and they go, I think, every 15 minutes. It's only about a 10, 15 minute ride, and another plus, we, we rent a car some years, but we leave the car and take the bus, because if you rent a car, you could be a half a mile away out in this giant grass parking lot, or the bus drops you right up by the front gate, which is super convenient. Um, again, it can get pretty warm, but here's a shot of what the dorms look like when you check in. Uh, there's not much to them, they're simple. You've got a window, you've got outlets, you've got desks and a bed, and that's it. So when we first get there, sometimes it's pretty warm and the first job is to cool down. Second job is to go out to the store, get lots of liquid refreshment. Um, here's a shot of the bus. Uh, the bus is pretty fun because it's loaded with pilots from all over the country. We strike up conversations on every bus ride. We met tons of people. Um, I sat next to Jimmy Doolittle's grandson on a bus ride last year. Um, now, car rental. We are lucky enough to have friends, the Farrells, who are uh, typically driving in now, and they, they bring a, a large van, which is super handy for us um, because we can go wherever we want, whenever we want. Um, car rental can be tough. Uh, if you're going to get a car for uh, the show at Oshkosh, get one now for, say, 2019. Um, I don't think you'll ever get one at Oshkosh. They have them available to pick up uh, at Oshkosh if you get them way, way in advance. They're expensive. Uh, we found much, much better deals at Appleton Airport, and there's a shuttle bus that runs from Oshkosh to Appleton and to Fond du Lac. It's fairly cheap. Um, we're going to go over a map in a few minutes, but uh, at the main entrance to Oshkosh, there's a, a bus terminal, and there are lines for the different buses, and the buses all have signs about where they go, but you can get a direct bus to Appleton <coughs> Airport or to Fond du Lac Airport and pick up rental cars at either of those. We've done that in the past. Uh, the good news is they're cheaper and more plentiful and available. The bad news is you got to take it back. Um, so what do you do now uh, to get yourself and the plane ready? First off, think about whether you're current, whether you're in practice. I know a lot of us, uh, myself included, have made the mistake of putting too much time into the plane, uh, to construction and, and working on that, and not enough time staying current. Um, Andy and some others will remember that the first time I flew my plane in, for instance, I had literally finished the last details on the plane uh, the Friday before the Sunday departure for the show. In grain, green pluck primer, I actually uh, was not very practiced, and I ended up getting what you're going to see is the hardest approach into Oshkosh, the 1-8 uh, left approach where you go down runway 36 and have to do a tight button hook at low altitude and land um, before you get to the tower. And it was a scenario where I was at about 75 feet in a 45 degree bank. Um, I don't think anybody wants to be there, especially if they're not particularly current. Um, I don't know if anybody has been ramp checked at Oshkosh, but I think it's a good idea to have all your documents ready. Make sure you have a current medical and just that you're ready, the plane's ready, you can start doing that now and you don't run into any problems where um, you run out of time to do it. Um, get the notum. You can download a copy, if you go on the EAA AirVenture website, they'll mail you a free copy, just on request. You just give them your address and a request, and they'll mail it out to you in a printed copy. Study it. If, if you haven't seen it, go on YouTube and watch the How Not to Arrive at Oshkosh video. There is a guy who did absolutely every single thing wrong coming into Oshkosh. And while the controller was trying to land hundreds of planes, he's just talking on the radio, doing everything wrong and taking up time. Um, the approach itself is easy. Um, you start, well, I guess you guys will start with this uh, little presentation and the, the pictures, but basically it, it's, it's very easy and we're gonna show you how to do it today. Um, there are announcements on the airventure.org uh, news page and you'll find that uh, they'll give you things like some of the things we're gonna talk about are mass arrivals that you have to avoid and some of the events and show times. Um, but, also, one thing that really, really helps that wasn't available when I first started flying in, watch some of the arrivals uh, videos on, uh, on YouTube. You can get a good first-person video perspective of what it looks like to fly your plane into the show. It's one thing to look at the notum and the diagrams. It's another to see what it looks like out the uh, cockpit of your plane uh, to get an idea of this sort of the, the pace and the radio flow and the traffic and what it looks like. Um, it really, really helps. If you Google Oshkosh arrival, you'll find a ton. If you go on my blog, you'll, you'll find one for each of the past four or five years with audio and a first-person perspective. 
I watched a bunch of them. Um, just do Oshkosh arrival videos and you'll see more. But I would study a number of those. Pause them, look at them. Um, I, I think they're terrific. About two weeks out, what you're gonna wanna do is um, check out the webcams. There are webcams on the wayfinding towers, which we'll talk more about, but basically they have different colored towers um, down the length of the main runway, 1836. And they're called wayfinding towers because just to remember where the hell you are. Um, I told my wife when I was first bringing her, uh, oh, 20 some years ago, I told her no matter how big I describe this, it's not gonna do it justice. It's bigger than you can possibly imagine. And she agreed with me. So what they do is they put these different colored towers so that you can know roughly where you're at at the show. And if you bring family or kids, you can tell them let's meet at this tower or remember we're parked by such and such tower. As you'll see, we're, we uh, on Velocity Row are parked down by the green uh, tower near the Warbirds and the Home Builders uh, headquarters. Now, when you get to one week out, all right, you're gonna start uh, looking at the weather, prepping, packing your gear for the plane. Um, I'm gonna post uh, on this video some of the mass arrival times, um, but start checking because that changes as the date gets near. Now, in terms of weather, um, I've always gone in VFR and we've made it in every single year. We've made it home most of the way every year, and we've always flown out on the day we choose, but um, you're gonna have to be flexible if you're VFR, and we're gonna talk about some of the best arrival times. Now, what days should you go and how long should you stay? I mean, if you're planning your trip now, what do you really wanna do? Um, some of us, myself included, consider this the best week of our year. Um, I look forward to this all year, Folks tease me because I start counting down around day 300. Um, so what do you want to do in terms of arrival time and departure time? What do you want to catch and what do you not want to miss? Um, the, basically, the show runs from Monday, July 23rd to Sunday, July 29th. Lots of folks arrive before that. Um, some folks get there a month early, believe it or not. There are a lot of volunteers who get in, and you'll start seeing people park there um, weeks before the show opens but lots of us arrive on Saturday and Sunday because if you're worried about the arrival, especially if it's your first time, it's a lot easier to come in on the weekend. It's a much less crowded in the air and on the ground. Um, you're still going to have a lot of other planes around you in the air, but it's nothing like coming in during the show. Um, it's less congested on your arrival and just as importantly, you'll get prime parking. On Velocity Row, uh, it's not just velocities. Uh, technically, EAA parking considers us heavies, and they put Lanceers, Velocities, Cozies, and just some of the bigger four and more seat planes in there. So when space is gone, it's gone. Uh, they parked a whole row of Epics there last year or the year before, and we just didn't have enough space for all the Velocities. So if, if you can get there on Saturday or Sunday, it's nice. Plus, Saturdays, you're gonna see a lot of planes coming in, and you get to see everybody arrive and park, and it's just fun to go down to the uh, uh, flight line, watch everybody landing. Sunday, it's actually become kind of a, a velocity tradition. We all gather uh, in the morning, and we head down to runway 27 near the VOR on the green dot, and we'll, I'll show you a map in a bit as to where that is, but it's, it's close to where the velocity row is, and we watch landings. And um, as Brett would say, the excitement level varies with the crosswind uh, levels. And sometimes it's very exciting. Um, you're gonna see a lot of near misses. You're gonna see some expert landings. Uh, we, we bet on who can actually make the green dot, who's gonna drag a wing. There's always something though that goes south and there's always a lot of excitement. And we end up with dozens of people sitting out there and having a good time catching up with each other as well. Now, in my experience, Monday, the opening day of the show is probably the busiest day to come in, but it's still totally doable. Again. Um, my experience was going from, believe it or not, a Cessna 152 and a Tampico TB9 to my Velocity uh, SERG. I only had 100 hours total time since my first flying lesson when I flew into Oshkosh, which I do not necessarily recommend. But if you're low time or you have a new plane, I think it's a good idea to try and come in on one of the non-peak days and hours. Um, Friday and Sunday, respectively, are very busy departure days, uh, but there are pluses and minuses. There are the biggest crowds on uh, the last weekend of the show, and some of the best things are saved for the last weekend. Um, by Sunday, what you're gonna find is there are lots of grass shadows and tired people. And what I mean by that is, 
people will visit your plane in droves, all the other planes as well. And you're going to find you have a crowd of people around your plane most of the day, and they trample the grass, and your plane shades the grass under it. So when you finally leave, there's going to be a green grass shadow of your plane perfectly outlined in the grass underneath where you park for the week. Um, but we talked a bit about days, but what about timing your arrival during each of the days? Um, the airport hours are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. throughout. And there's no aircraft movement, even on the field, allowed outside those hours. They want you parked, stopped by 8 p.m. at night. Um, we have found that uh, we also somehow end up arriving a lot of times just because of delays and lunches and things like that during the daily air show. Monday through Sunday, it's 2.30 to 6.30, and the airport is closed during those periods. Wednesday and Saturday, 8 to 10 p.m., it's closed as well. And then Sunday is closed from 1 to 4.30. Um, no big deal. Uh, do your best to get around the weather and do what you need to do in terms of departure time and arrival time. Um, the airport opens around 30 minutes after the end of the show, and they will announce it on the ATIS. Um, I say around 30 minutes because I've seen it where it's less, and I've seen it where it's more than an hour. But the important thing is Appleton and Fond du Lac are minutes away. You can literally see Oshkosh when you take off from either. And so if you get there and it's just about to uh, start or it's, the show is already on, um, just land. Uh, use the bathroom, get a snack, whatever. Uh, they have hot dog stands set up. Uh, the ramp is filled with interesting planes. You're there. Don't worry about it. You're already enjoying your time. So land at one of those airports. Um, listen to the ATIS. And uh, I can tell you, when the airport is reopening, you'll see people stealthily walking around listening to uh, – their phones or uh, the radio to the ATIS. And it's kind of like a strategic air command scramble when they reopen it. Everybody runs to their plane, starts up and lines up and it's on. You try to get to the uh, arrival procedure, but no big deal. Um, it's, it's really actually kind of an experience if you've never done it to just land at one of those airports and check it out and then head over to Oshkosh. We've also gotten there the day before when we did the hotel room landed at one of those airports, and then flew in the next day. Um, now, mass arrivals. A lot of folks like to come in uh, in groups of types. The Cessnas to Oshkosh have published that they're coming in Sunday at 7.30 a.m. The Moonies are scheduled to come in Saturday at noon. The Bonanzas are leaving Rockford Saturday as a, as a group at noon and arriving shortly thereafter. Now, when I tell you these are large groups, I mean huge, as in there is a solid line of Bonanzas taxiing nose to tail for half an hour. Um, it's massive numbers of airplanes. Um, a couple of years ago, we also were witnessing the Mooney mass arrival on Saturday and the first guy in the landing, which they had practiced for years, didn't fully extend his gear, shut down the runway. Every other Mooney had to divert after all that time and effort and everyone else had to divert as well. So probably the worst time to come in is, is during one of these mass arrivals. If you do, um, they may put out a, a put you on a hold or you might sneak in a little before or after, but remember Fond du Lac and Appleton are your little holds where you can go over and be more comfortable than just circling a lake. Now, what do you bring? Um, let's start with airplane stuff. Uh, and by that, I mean all the things you're going to need that are airplane specific as opposed to personal gear. We tend to fly over Lake Erie and Lake Michigan every year and just go in a straight line from Pennsylvania. Uh, I recommend highly that if you're going over a lake, Although the velocity will float indefinitely, bring life preservers. Um, Dwayne Swing, Swing kind of famously has told us that uh, your, your ditching procedure is ditch, climb out on the strake, and fish until rescue arrives. I mean, these things will never sink, but I will have a life preserver and uh, survival gear. By that, I mean uh, a handheld radio and uh, uh, an ELT with me on every overwater crossing. Bring along a means to secure your rudders. Uh, people have had their rudders damaged because there's always some sort of strange weather at Oshkosh. There's always a storm during the week at some point uh, and your rudders will flap in the wind and they can be damaged. There are a number of options that you can bring for that um, from chip clips, um, homemade ones. I, I just published some. You can take an aluminum, a uh, little piece of aluminum tab, put two pieces of clear tubing and just slide it in so that uh, you slide in the gap between the rudder and the lower winglet. That's fine. I also went even simpler than that. If you bring some one inch um, Gorilla tape or duct tape, just put a tiny two inch tab at the bottom of your rudder. You're good for the week. 
um, I recommend bringing a cover. Uh, your airplane will get dirty and wet at Oshkosh. You have 800,000 people tromping around in grass, and every single day your plane is going to be covered with dust that's been stirred up and blown onto it. Um, bring cleaning supplies. We have a little cleaning kit that we bring just for Oshkosh. One of the best things that we found is a thing called a California water wand. And uh, that's a trade name if you look it up online. But any kind of large water squeegee will work. Um, every single morning uh, when you come out to the plane, it's going to be covered with dust and heavy dew. And that's a good thing because if you squeegee it, the dust comes off and all the dirt comes off with the water and you end up with a, a fairly clean plane right off. Um, so the typical morning routine for everyone with their planes at Oshkosh is to have their squeegee, to bring a selection of rags, to bring some plexus or other uh, canopy cleaner. And the first thing you do in the morning is take the cover off, lay it out to dry, squeegee the water off the plane with the dirt coming off with it, um, get the rags to get the remainder, uh, then use plexus on the uh, ple plexiglass, get it all nice looking. Typically, uh, we will also put on the pedo covers and chip clips at night and then take them off and store them in the plane during the day. Uh, I personally also like to bring some sort of uh, uh, oily rags for anything like that to clean up, and we bring flits for all the metal parts. They come in little tiny tubes. Uh, I will also recommend that you bring a repair kit. I think everybody should have one of those on any long trip, but we've found that we've, we've used the repair kit on a number of occasions. You'll find sometimes cowling screws are missing. Uh, you need to tighten the cowling screws. Uh, you want to uh, fix a little leak. You might have very small repairs that you need to make. So we bring that along every year. A little duct tape goes a long way too. Also, you're going to need tie downs. Uh, you're required to tie down, uh, tie down your plane. Um, most people that I've talked to have found the claw the most effective one there. It's easy to put in. It's very, very secure. It's It stows small. Um, but it, it, it's a good option. There's no requirement that you use that, um, but bring a good tie down, whatever you're comfortable with. The other things you need to bring are your parking signs. Uh, if you're VFR, bring a VFR departure sign. If you're IFR, bring an IFR departure sign for leaving. For arriving, you have a choice. Um, they're all set forth in the uh, AirVenture uh, site, and they're also set forth in the NOTAM. Um, if you want to camp with your plane, you're going to need uh, an aircraft camping sign. If you want to be with the sound velocity row, all you need is an HBP, Home Built Parking Sign. I have one uh, I'll show you at the end of this presentation that I made, finally a double-sided laminated one so I don't have to keep doing it every year. But uh, after you land, you're just going to hold it up, and that's all you're going to have to do, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Absolutely positively, bring a, a folding chairs. You're going to be walking for miles and miles and miles. You're going to want to sit down at the flight line. You're going to want to sit down at uh, presentations. You're going to want to sit under your plane under the wing and hang out with people. So bring a nice folding chair. I bring a day pack every year to carry my chair. And also, as you're wandering through the exhibit buildings, they have anything and everything you can possibly imagine that has anything remotely to do with aviation. Um, if you were looking for, for instance, obscure hardware or to restock your toolbox of parts or that one MS24693 dash whatever screw, uh, there is a hardware tent that sells nothing but tiny bits of hardware. You're looking for a new handheld. You're looking for aviation related, cl related clothing or uh, something with your logo on it. You'll have it. Um, so bring a day pack to carry your little purchases around so you don't have to lug them in your hand. You must have a hat. Uh, I know I particularly need a hat, but uh, you will get sunburned if you don't have a hat. You need sunscreen and you need to use it because you will be out on a field with no shelter from the sun all day. Um, make sure you stay hydrated. Bring a water bottle uh, and something to carry it in. Um, bring a camera because you're going to see things that you never see anywhere else at Oshkosh. Aircraft that you can't see anywhere else. Groups of aircraft that you can't see together anywhere else. Uh, a collection of velocities that you're never going to see anywhere else in the world. Your aircraft with all those things as background. Um, one of the terrific things in Velocity Row is you can sit and see the air show. Um, they did bombers on uh, parade last year, and every single light bomber flew over us at a 45-degree angle at low altitude over and over and over, and I got tremendous pictures and video. Um, one thing that you may not think about that's a good idea to bring are cards. 
and I'll show you an example at the end of the presentation. But um, what I mean by that are little business cards are very cheap to have printed up these days. We have one with our names and end number of our plan and a picture of the plan on one side and contact information on the other. You'll meet tons of people. You'll want to be able to uh, get in touch with them again. And people will ask you lots of questions. We have a blog um, that we like to refer people to if they want to learn more about the velocity. So instead of writing this on scraps of paper, I just hand them a card every year or every time. And uh, we've actually met tons of people who we still keep in touch with. That. So I think it's a good idea. Now, clothing. What do you bring in terms of clothing? Here's the funny thing. Um, the weather at Oshkosh will be anything. Uh, it's the same week basically every year, but you can have freezing cold, broiling, terrible heat above 100 degrees. It can be dry, it can be rainy, or some combination of all of the above. Um, if you've been there for many years, you'll remember Splashkosh, where it just rained and rained and rained and everything was a swamp. Um, they actually didn't allow you to come in until Tuesday because when they pushed the planes off the runway, they just got stuck. Um, there's been frost cops where it's just been freezing cold and you had to wear fleece and a jacket, hat, and long pants all the time. I've been there during heat waves. We've been there where the temperature shifts from one end of that spectrum to the other. Um, so watch the forecast as it comes up. Uh, the long-range forecast, I can tell you right now, for what good it is trending, is that it's been colder than usual, and the lake temperatures are colder than usual, so they're anticipating a cool Oshkosh, which, again, if you stay in an unair conditioned dorm room, is a blessing. Bring a hat, as I said. Um, bring comfy shoes. One of the guys that we took there um, thought it would be a good idea to bring his leather boat shoes and no socks. He lasted for about three hours, and then he had to go to the Columbia outlet to buy sneakers and, and socks. You totally need very comfy shoes, sneakers, boots, something. Um, bring sunproof clothing. Uh, the old joke is if you go to Oshkosh and someone asks you, uh, did you see so-and-so? Well, what's he wearing? Oh, he had a Columbia shirt, cargo shorts, and a baseball cap. That's basically 70% of the pilots at Oshkosh wear the same thing. Um, those lightweight nylon fishing shirts are great. Uh, a lot of people wear those. Baseball caps, the uh, safari hats that go up on the side are good. Um, I tend to bring both because uh, when I wear a baseball cap, it shades my face mostly. And then by about halfway through the week, the back of my neck starts to burn. So really think long and hard about sun protective clothing. You're going to fry if you don't. Bring rain gear. Um, I don't usually bring an umbrella because for whatever reason, whenever it seems to be rainy at Oshkosh, it's also windy. But I've seen people with umbrellas. It's not a bad idea. Uh, I bring a rain jacket and that generally gets me through. I don't bring rain pants or anything more involved. If you totally forget, everybody sells little EAA disposable plastic ponchos. And if you want to get by that uh, with that, it's fine. One thing that I didn't think of uh, for the first few times I went until I actually damaged it is uh, something waterproof to uh, put your phone in on those rainy days because being out all day, you're going to get your phone wet no matter how hard you try, in the backpack, in your pocket, wherever. So I just bring a simple Ziploc bag to put my phone in. Um, I think that's a good idea. Bring a warm layer because um, early in the morning, it can be cold. Um, I know Rene Dugat tends to have about five layers of clothes on, clothes on in the morning and shed them a little bit as the day goes by. But even uh, my wife and I tend to uh, find that some mornings at Oshkosh are, are fairly cool. Uh, we like to get to the show early, and sometimes we stay late, and early and late can be cool. We've actually had to borrow clothes uh, for the Velocity Picnic sometimes because it got really, really cold. Um, so look at the forecast. Look at the highs and lows. You're better off having a little of everything and layering. Now, let's talk about flight planning. Um, first off, very generally, um, you should add at least 30 minutes to your anticipated arrival when uh, flight planning, um, because otherwise you're gonna run into problems with not closing your flight plan, be it VFR or IFR. You are going to have delays getting in, and if you watch any of my uh, videos, you're gonna see that we enter the uh, approach and have to turn out and start again more times than we don't, because it used to be that uh, they would tell you to start at a particular point, which we're gonna talk about, and people would get to that general vicinity and then sort of file into a line. Um, what's happened over the years with GPS though, is everybody arrives at a distinct point in space. So you're all coming to this exact point uh, and you're gonna have to probably sequence and spend some time sequencing in. There's a limitation that IFR flight plans have to be filed at least 22 hours in advance. VFR flight plans, there are no limits. 
Um, typically what we do is we file our flight plan just before maybe 15, 20 minutes before we take off. I've never had a problem. Now, plan on arriving at Oshkosh with plenty of fuel. Uh, we typically stop somewhere uh, just on the far side of the lake coming from Philadelphia. And that means we have about an hour flight in with maybe 50 gallons on board. Uh, that leaves me with lots of fuel. I could circle, I could uh, go over to Appleton or Fond du Lac and I could take off again all without having to refuel. Um, I, I just find that I have a lot more peace of mind when I have lots of fuel when I go in. I don't ever want to have to divert because I've been out of hold and I run out of fuel. Now, overall flight planning, again, if we're talking generalisms, the thing to bear in mind if you're nervous about this, the only different part about this is the FISC approach, your last 10, 12, 15 minutes of the flight. The rest is just flying like you're flying anywhere else on a long trip. Um, and basically, all you're going to have to do is fly to Ripon, follow some railroad tracks to FISC, and then follow in instructions given to you uh, by the controllers right down to the runway. And once on the ground, this is what's really great. Uh, once on the ground, your work is done. Mentally, uh, obviously stay alert, but your work is done. You're going to put your HBP or other parking sign up, and Flagman will direct you individually all the way to your parking spot and then actually help you park. I mean, they will literally pull you into the spot and stay there until you're ready to tie down. That's it's a big airport. There's a lot going on, but it's. I have to tell you, I've, even the first time, I found that easy. You literally have people every couple hundred yards along. You can see the next one before you get to the one ahead of you. So you never feel lost, never feel stressful, and they will direct you right over. And again, if you have the HBP sign up, they're going to put you right on Velocity Row. Um, and we'll. I'll show you the uh, the general diagram, and we'll walk through that in a minute. So let's go through this step by step. Here's our arrival procedure. Now, you're flying along from wherever you're going, and you're going to make your first uh, part of your approach at Ripon. Um, so wherever you're coming in from, uh, plan, I don't know whether you're going to go over the lake, whether you're going to go around the lake, whether you're coming from the west. Frankly, I've never done that, so I don't know what the, uh, the terrain is like out there. But when you start getting near Ripon, this is where you want to have uh, your game on. So you've got to have your lights on. Uh, and I turn the landing light on, and I turn on the position uh, lights and strobes. Then you monitor the arrival ATIS on 1259, and you note the runways in use. They'll say, uh, uh, that's one of the first things that you're going to hear in the ATIS, is that runways uh, 27 and 36 are in use. Sometimes they'll just say, runway 27 is the sole runway in use. But whatever it is, you've got your NOTAM with you, and I put little yellow sticky tabs on them, and I have each runway uh, approach and instructions tagged in there with just a 2718, whatever. So once I get to that point and I'm approaching Ripon, we just flip that open and I've got it on my lap. And I, I've already studied it, but you know, I have it there anyway as sort of a crutch. I have a little cheat sheet with these sorts of little uh, notes that I have on this page in front of you, right in front of me, so that I'm, I'm checking that off as I go. Because you are excited. Um, it's sort of a, a high workload scenario as you get into the traffic. So cut yourself some slack and have, have a backup in case you forget anything, have this in front of you. So you monitor FISC approach after that on 120.7 after you get the ATIS. Um, now there are two approaches. There's the high approach and the low approach. The high approach is at 2,300 feet and 135 knots. Uh, the low approach is at 1,800 feet and 90 knots. I've done both. The 2,300 foot approach at 135 knots is much, much easier in a velocity um, because on the low approach at the 90 knots, there are aircraft that are struggling to maintain 90 knots. There are nervous guys in Cessna who don't want, a high, don't want a high workload, and those guys are dragging it along at below 90 knots. So what can happen on the low approach is you find yourself at a high power setting, just wallowing along, um, hanging on the prop with your oil temperatures going up. That being said, um, sometimes they will tell you that um, the 1,800-foot approach is the only one in use. So I've done it. A velocity can do it. You just have to stay on the numbers, keep it 90, and uh, you can do it. The high approach, which is most always available, is the preferred approach in velocity. It's much easier to do. You're going to have cooler temperatures and a lot easier time. Now, even when you're approaching Ripon, watch for traffic. Again, everybody is approaching the same exact spot from all different directions. So I have my passengers watch as well. Um, for me, the, uh, 
traffic on my screen is completely useless most of the time because for two reasons. First off, there are so many that if I don't zoom way in, it covers my screen with black uh, traffic targets. Second, a lot of the aircraft in there um, don't have transponders. And a lot of the transponders are going to be turned off because once you get there, if you have a non-ABSB transponder, you're supposed to put it on standby. Uh, again, otherwise they're just overwhelmed with signals. If you have an ABSB transponder, this year, as far as I know, for the first time, you can leave it on. Um, but watch for traffic. What you're going to do as well is uh, you're going to get in line behind somebody. Um, once you've done that, you're most of the way there in terms of making this happen. Because literally, unless the guy in front of you screws up, you're just going to be following him in. So you're going to be checking everything else off, but it's kind of, a, a again, a nice easy aid to have that aircraft ahead of you. Um, so we talked about getting to Ripon and what to do there. Now, Ripon to Fisk is the next leg of this journey. You're going to use a water tower and a grain elevator in the little town ahead of you. And I'm going to show you pictures in a few minutes. Um, you see the water tower and the grain elevator, and then you're going to follow over some railroad tracks. To me, I used to have a lot of trouble finding that. I don't even look for railroad tracks anymore outside of town. I look in town near the, uh, the pavement, and you can see the uh, railroad tracks. When you get out of town, it looks to me more like a perfectly straight line of trees through the fields. I just look for that. But moreover, look for traffic. Everybody's lining up here. And you're going to find people coming from every direction converging there. Now, when you see this, check out the plane ahead of you. Is it somebody you can stay behind? Uh, and can you maintain a speed that won't run them over? We're faster than most people and uh, or most aircraft. So what you're going to find is... Sometimes you have to turn back out, go back and start over uh, approaching Ripon because you don't want to run the guy ahead of you over. You're, there's no S turning allowed. And if it's too slow, it's just going to make it harder for you. And it's easier to just go back and start over. It takes a couple minutes. So once you're on this Ripon to Fisk run, you listen for instructions. They're not going to call you by your end, end number. They're not going to call you a velocity. They're going to call you an easy type. So, the instructions will be along these lines from the FIS controllers. And by the way, the FIS controllers have a little trailer down at uh, this intersection. Um, and I've never seen them. I, I think some people have. But I know, for instance, Andy Millen's friend was working there one, one time and greeted him by, by name. But for me, I just listen and I listen to him talking to the, the planes ahead of me. And you're going to hear them saying, uh, high wing with a wigwag, uh, rock your wings. And you're not supposed to reply on the radio. You just rock your wings when they tell you, and they'll say, good rock. So what I do is I look at the plane ahead of me, and that's going to give me, uh, and the plane ahead of him, you can typically see two ahead. And I listen to them, and that gives me a good idea of where I'm going to get this uh, instruction, because I always get a little nerved out. Like, do they see me? Are they going to miss me? Am I going to overrun this? They're not. Uh, they're doing this all the time. You're not going to get missed. If you're on the, uh, the right track over the uh, railroad track, they will see you, but it's not going to be until you're about two miles from Fisk. So mentally, it really helps me uh, to see the guy ahead of me rock his wings. That's when I know I'm going to be around that point when they tell me to rock my wings. When they tell you to rock your wings and you acknowledge, they'll say, good rock. They're going to tell you the runway and the frequency you should use. Now, if there are two runways in use, for instance, again, it's typical for them to use runway 27 and runway 36 left and right. They might tell you, uh, easy type, follow the tracks for runway 27. Um, 27, as you're going to see in a minute, is harder than 36. 27 involves doing uh, a tight right uh, pattern, whereas 36 is basically turn right uh, when you get these instructions. You see the airport, and then you turn left on base, uh, from base to uh, final and land. It's super easy. So you can just tell them, approach, easy request, 36. And I have not heard anybody denied that request if there's more than one runway open. Um, what happens sometimes is someone will do a gear up, there's an incident on the runway, there's some other issue, and they will only have one runway and you don't have a choice. Your option there is either to land on the runway that's open or again, divert to Appleton, Fond du Lac, and try again later on. Now, you're at Fisk, you've just rocked your wings. Um, by the way, get a picture or video of that because that's a moment. Um, you're, that's a sort of iconic moment in the Oshkosh approach, the rock your wings thing. Um, so when you get that, they'll tell you to switch over to tower frequency, and there's a different frequency for each runway in use. 
So say you're landing on 3.6 left. They're going to tell you which frequency to switch to for that. Um, it's in the notum. Keep, and we're going to talk about it in more detail in a minute. But keep your eye on the plane ahead of you and maintain that spacing. Make absolutely sure your gear is down. Uh, sometimes at FISC, they'll tell you to put your gear down. And the tower will tell you again to put your gear down. But the last thing you want to do is do a gear up at Oshkosh in front of everybody far away from home. Uh, you just don't want that to happen. So at this point, I always put my gear down. I'm not waiting until I get on my final approach. So here we go. This is the NOTAM. Um, I hope everybody has a good view of this. And in fact, um, can somebody tell me if they're hearing me? All right, great. Wanted to make sure I'm just talking away. So this is super, super easy. I'm going to show you the cursor here. So here you are in Ripon. From wherever you're coming in, for me, I'm coming up like this from Milwaukee. I get to Ripon, and that's it. Now, I've done all that stuff we described, and all I'm going to do, really, is I'm going to go down here, lake on my left. I'm going to go to over Picket and to Fisk. And right around here, they're going to tell me to rock my wings as I approach Fisk. And then they're going to tell me to either um, do the approach, most typically, up the railroad tracks for 27, or I'm just going to turn right there. They'll say, um, easy type, make a right turn for left base for 3-6. And so I just turn right, right here. There's a highway. I go right down the middle of the highway. And then way back here, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, you're going to see Oshkosh. And you're going to see 3-6, which is a giant runway with aircraft parked all around over here on the, the show side. So you just come down. Couldn't be easier. Keep your spacing. And when you get down here, you do your left base, you land, you're going to roll out, and they will tell you, uh, easy type, turn left at the next uh, exit. And you turn left, and there's a flag man waiting for you. Super easy. And then they'll direct you point by point. Down here at the lower right, there's a picture of what this looks like. Again, the railroad tracks to me look like a line of trees um, at the time we're going there. But... Um, here are the two options. You're either going to go up and to the right toward 2-7, or you're just going to turn right and go down toward 3-6. It looks like that. Now, um, I'm going to go through each of the runway options for you because you may have a choice. So let's go through what the approach looks like for each and which ones are the easiest and most, most desirable and which ones you might want to consider opting out or asking for an alternative. So runway 27, I think this is the most common, and we've been asked to land this just about every year for the last five or six years. Um, that's the one I just showed you, where you just follow the tracks up, and you're going to go up here, and you're going to land this way toward the lake. So you go up, you come down. Before you get to the lake, you're going to do a uh, right for base, a right for final, and land coming back the way you came. Um, the easy way orientation wise is two seven and when you get up there is going to be pointing uh, back from the lake so you're going to be approaching on runway nine and if you went down uh, runway nine you'd end up off the lake at the far end of it um, what they're going to ask you to do is to stay inside the gravel pit so when you get to the near side of runway nine on the left of the runway you're going to see a big gravel pit and they'll, they don't want you to go to the left of that in your direction of travel but um, the closer you get to the runway on the downwind, the tighter that turn is going to be because you're not going to know as you're going downwind necessarily where on the runway you're going to land because there are colored dots down the runway. And there, this is the only place that I know of in the world where multiple aircraft are landing on the same runway at the same time. So just ahead of you is a, an aircraft, and they're going to give him a dot further down the runway. They're going to give you a dot in the middle of the runway. They're going to give somebody else a dot at the near end of the runway. And everybody's landing at the same time. So as you're going down, pay attention where the dots are. I typically start the uh, downwind run at 1,000 feet and a 500 foot per minute down descent. I'm ready to land, and I'm ready to turn right from my uh, base at any time. I cheat it to the left as far as I can on downwind. I'll show you a picture in a minute. There's a road to the left of the runway that parallel, uh, parallels runway 927. I stay to the left of that. Um, and then I listen for my assigned dot and my landing clearance. For instance, easy type, you're cleared to land on the green dot. Once you have that, you can turn in and land. And they'll typically say, turn your base at the numbers, turn your base at the, the orange dot or whatever. They'll tell when to turn base and that you're cleared to land. 
Now, here's the good news. You can easily stop from any of the dots on the runway. It doesn't matter which one you're clear to. Don't worry about it. It's a huge runway. You can stop from any of them. So here's our diagram. Um, again, what you're going to do is you're coming from Fisk, and you've made that right turn to continue following the railroad tracks. You're going to come up there. You have the airport in sight the whole time now. You can see the whole thing laid out before you, and I'll show you in a picture in a minute, but it's super easy. There's that gravel pit. Down here, there, here's the road that I told you about. And there are neighborhoods over here to the left of the airport. And you get to see those houses up close and personal. So come up here. And yes, I turn before the gravel pit, but I don't turn here. I stay just inside the gravel pit so that the road over here is on my right as I'm going down the runway. The further you are from the runway, the easier it's going to be to make that final base and final. Now, don't be surprised. This over here is the edge of the lake. That's the shoreline. Many times what will happen is somebody screws up or they're, they're just taking it too slow and it's starting to get close. And what they'll do is they'll extend people out over the lake. So that's actually a good thing. Count that as a blessing. If the controller tells you extend over the lake, I'll tell you when to turn your base or extend over the lake and follow the traffic ahead of you, maintain spacing. That's going to give you lots of extra time to do everything you need to do. It may be that you come down here and you get uh, midfield and they say, make your base at the orange dot, land on the green dot. And then you just turn and do this. So don't do anything you aren't comfortable doing. Um, I can tell you that it's, it's not terrible if you cheat it out this way. It's not really hard. And if you watch in the approaches, there's nothing dramatic going on. But watch your speed. Watch your power setting. Watch your descent rate. Make sure that that dot is not you know, going up or down in your canopy. And um, don't make that base to final turn too slow or too low. I've done both, and it's not pretty. Um, I always salvage it, but... I think I've gotten it down to the point now where uh, it's not even dramatic. You just want to sort of I end up making a general circle to land sort of um, because you're not going to square anything off here. So a nice circle to land, come in, put it down. And once you put it on the ground, they're going to tell you where to turn off. And typically for me, they brought me down to the end of the runway all the way to the end. And then I taxi all the way back. And then I cross here and then they'll bring me up to parking. And we're going to go over that. But um Let's show the next page here. Here's what it looks like. So from this perspective, the gravel pit is just off to the left of the airplane. There's that road that I told you about, the far left road over by the neighborhoods. I go up this street right here, just to the left of the big road. And that's my, my landmark. And as I'm coming up that street there, I'm looking over and here are the dots on the runway. And so you come up here and at some point, he's either gonna tell you, make your base, I just come in and I'm descending fairly good now and I turn and land. I'm not squaring it off at all really. I'm doing whatever I need to do to make a nice curve around here. Um, if I have to extend out over the lake, super, whatever. That gives me a really long time to sort things out and a long final. And I've landed on the numbers and the various dots and then you end up coming up here to the end, coming around, taxi back and right here at this intersection you're going to come back over and our parking is right here. This is Warbirds, and here's us over here. And you're just going to come taxi right up. This is taxiway Papa 1. So you come up, over, up Papa 1, and they will direct you in an entrance right here. There's going to be a guy on a scooter right in front of you the whole way, and he's going to direct you in. And then you'll park right on Velocity Row right here. So, again, this is your sight picture. Remember the road. Remember the gravel pit off to the left. And the runway here is it, it's all in view. It's all laid out. Remember that 1836 is left to right along the lake. This is 36, and this is 18. And we're going to talk about that approach, but to have the nice visual here, this helps. So if you were coming in runway 36, you come this way, you turn over here, you turn right on your base, you're coming down. It takes maybe five minutes to get from uh, Fisk over to here. You turn left, you land, and there, there's a taxiway on the far side closer to the lake. Uh, that's 36 right during the show. 36 left is the bigger runway, and you would land and come up here. And again, they'll bring you down all the way to the end, down the taxiway between the two runways, and you'll turn right, go up Papa 1, and you'll go in Velocity Row, home base for us. So moving along, this is um, the side view of, of it. When you're coming in, you can see the runway. This is um, 36, and there are the dot, or excuse me, 27, the dots and everything. And then runway nine, 
This one is super easy. I've only gotten this once. If you get offered runway nine, take runway nine. Um, basically, it's like a space shuttle approach. Uh, remember when we uh, were at Fisk and if we were going to do two seven, we follow the uh, tracks up at a sort of 45 degree angle toward the gravel pit. Well, this one, you just turn right before you get to the gravel pit and you land. There's, there's no real approach. You just fly up, you see the airport, you land over the highway and that's it. And then you would come down, they're gonna turn you off. You'll come up to Papa One. And again, we're right here on the right. We're sort of up near the intersection of uh, 2-7 and uh, 1836, most of the way up, right in there. So you're just gonna come down, do what they tell you, and you'll end up right there. But this is super easy. And again, perspective wise, if you were doing the 2-7 approach, you're gonna come down over here, over the neighborhoods to the left of the airport, come down toward the lake and either get almost to the lake shore or whatever dot they tell you to turn adjacent to, come back and land, super easy. But runway nine, boy, that's the, the gimme, the easy runway if you get a chance to do it. And again, here's a diagram. Um, you're gonna come over and you land. Now, there's not much of a diagram. From Fisk, you just come up, you turn right and you land. Super easy. And again, you come down, they would taxi you back up and, and bring you over to our parking. Um, runway 36. This is the second easiest. I think this is terrific. It's super easy to land. You get a sight picture right from Fisk or a moment later. Basically, what you're, you're going to do is when you get to Fisk and um, you've rocked your wings, they're going to tell you uh, turn right for a, a left base for uh, two six, or three six. Within a few seconds after making that turn and heading down the highway, um, you'll have your, your bearings. You're gonna shoot for the right edge of the airport. You're gonna listen for the left or right assignment, which may change as you approach. Um, because if somebody comes in on the Warbird arrival, uh, they'll put them onto runway uh, 36 right, and they'll make you change to the left. Um, but all you're gonna do is come up, make a base to final turn, and land. Super easy. Here's the diagram, right? So you're coming over from Fisk. You've just rocked your wings over here. You've turned right, and you're now on a left base. You cross the big highway. Now you got to get ready. Again, um, for me, I'm at about 90 knots, and I'm descending at 500 feet per minute. I'm set up for landing. I'm checking my gear several times so I don't screw up. You make a nice left, and you have all the runway in the world. They'll probably give you a dot. If somebody's behind you close, they might say, keep it in the air until the yellow dot, keep it in the air until the pink dot. Um, you land, and once you land, uh, the, the tower controller is gonna tell you, exit the next taxiway, follow the flagman. And that's literally all you do. So super easy here as well. The NOTAM gives you the, uh, the landing distances from each dot. Again, they're all fine for us. I mean, I think any of us can land in 3,400 feet on a huge runway with an approach like this. Um, oh, and one more thing. So you're gonna come down and you're gonna come over to a taxiway. They're gonna bring you down again to Papa One and you're gonna turn left when you get to the end of the taxiway. And it brings you up here and you'll park up in this area. So here's what it looks like. Here's your actual site picture. You've just uh, made the right turn at Fisk. You've flown down there. You crossed over the big highway and now you're about to land. Um, it doesn't get easier than this. You're this far away, so you're gonna have a long final. You turn left over here, you bring it in, and they've actually got a grassy uh, sort of cut area here in the grass for the center line. Uh, most of us have extended runway center, li center lines on our EFIS units anyway, but this is impossible to mess up. You make a nice high easy turn out here, you do a long final, you're gonna land, you're gonna turn off here, you're gonna do a, this taxiway up here with the show on your left, you're gonna to go to the very end, and at the very end is Papa One, the taxiway that leads to heavy parking, which is on the left over by Warbirds. You don't have to remember any of this because the controller is gonna tell you when to turn off. The, uh, the flagmen are gonna be stationed along here with flags waving you along. They're gonna tell you where to turn left, which is gonna be at the end. And then there's gonna be a guy on a scooter assigned just to you to scoot you up to where you turn off. They'll open the uh, little flag gate. They will take you in the scooter right in. Now. Something to be said about that. Sometimes when you land um, and you get up to Papa One and you get to the velocity turn off into our little parking area, especially on the weekends, they'll let you taxi all the way into your spot where you're gonna tie down. That is down the taxiway, through the show area, past the porta potties, past the subway, turn left and you park. If it's during the show or if there are a lot of people around, 
they're going to tell you to shut down and give you the symbol or beep their little uh, scooter horns at you and you got to shut it down. It's slightly downhill and super easy to pull down to your spot. Also, I'll be there and a lot of other people are going to be there to help you pull in. It couldn't be easier. Here's a view as you turn base to final on 3.6. Again, super easy, long final as you can see. You can see that little path that's carved in between the fields there. <laughs> There's a runway center line you can't miss. Uh, you're going to go up here, turn off right around here, follow this taxiway down to the end right here and left. And this is our uh, parking up there. The lake would be over here to your right, just for orientation. It's not very far either. We're almost on the lake at Oshkosh. Now, runway 18. This one's tough. I did this once, and it's the worst pattern I've ever done with full power, idle cutoff, sharp banks, everything in between, no situational <laughs> awareness. I thought it was really tough. You guys would have an easier time with this because you'll have some idea where you were. I had no idea, and the tower was telling me, turn base now, turn final now, and then I figured it out. But this is like that runway 36 that we just saw. I'm going to go back. But what you're going to do is go out here, turn downwind, go down toward the end of the runway, and then before the tower, which is right here, you have to turn left and left again and do a really tight button hook and land back the other way. That's tough. If you have a choice, don't do runway 18 left. If you have to, you're going to have to decide whether you're up to it or not, uh, and you're going to have to cheat it out to the right so that you don't have it as tight as I had it. Um, now, there's also another one where they can send you via the railroad tracks to do the same thing. Here's, here's the pattern we just talked about. Um, over the highway, for the 3-6 left and right approach, you just turn and land. For the 1-8, you're going to have to go up. See the tower here? When you get a beam in the tower, you're going to turn, and you're going to land. Don't go any further because you're gonna have landing traffic, including jet traffic and high speed heavies up here, landing on nine or two seven at the same time. You do not wanna go past the tower. So up, left, left and land. It's doable. I did it with 150 hours, I think, uh, in a standard RG. So here's the uh, railroad track approach. So if they tell you to go to one eight left or right via the railroad tracks, not so bad. You do the, your same old thing um, as if you were landing on 2-7. You go up to the gravel pit, you cheat it out, and they've, they've actually shown it cheated out a little here. Um, you cheat it out, and then you're just going to do a right turn and land on 1-8 right or left, which is actually not bad. So the only one I don't like is um, the one standard 1-8 left or right approach where you have to do that tight turn. This is just as easy as any of the others. Um, some notes on landings. you got to make absolutely sure your gear is down. Um, Check it multiple times. Uh, I put it down at Fisk. Some people put it down at Ripon. Uh, I keep mine up until Fisk because I find that for my aircraft, my oil temperatures stay lower because I'm not, uh, I don't know, it's just the power settings and the drag. So I keep my gear up until Fisk and then I put it down. It would probably be cooler if I uh, kept it up, but you know what? I'm not willing to make that mistake because I think I could do it. Um, fly the airplane. Uh, don't get nerved out. This is just an airport, and the runways are huge. Once you get onto the approach, there's somebody right ahead of you, and everything's all laid out for you, and nothing really happens that fast. You just can't run anybody over. You have to maintain your spacing and your situational awareness. I think it happened. Uh, it helps a huge amount now that you've been able to see it from uh, perspective and on the NOTAM. Uh, to me, seeing pictures and seeing videos just gave the NOTAM a whole better level of understandability. Um, it's just an airport and the runways are huge. There are probably only going to be two choices or maybe even no choice. You might just get an easy runway and boom, you know what to do. You've got it on your lap. You've seen this. Um, you've seen the pictures. You probably have seen videos. Bearing that in mind, you can always say unable. And I know uh, Andy's gone around when they, they jammed him up on an approach, no fault of his own. I never have and I should have. So my, my getting better at this is I might... I, I have to be willing to say unable instead of trying to salvage a really difficult approach because you can always go around. You just inform the tower immediately that you are going around. They will sequence you right back in. They will not send you back to the beginning. So after landing, um, again, the tower is going to tell you where to turn off. And remember to hold your parking sign up, and then you're going to go over to ground. The flagman will be there. I don't Actually, they have talked to me from ground frequency, um, just telling me when to cross the runway. And that's just augmenting the flagman because the flagman will direct you every moment of your taxi from the time you get off the runway 
till the time you're stopped in your parking spot. Now, I've had them ask me to taxi in the grass on occasion, and sometimes I have, and sometimes I just wave my hand at them and tell them to come up and talk to me, and I say, no, I need a hard surface. And when I've asked, they've always given me a hard surface, and the other pilots I've talked to have said, yeah, uh, they've never denied me a request for a hard surface taxi. Um, the place is immaculately maintained. It's like a parking lot or a, a putting green. So I didn't have a problem when I was taxing, but I have to say with my very expensive prop in the back, uh, especially in the lower RG that sits lower to the ground than the uh, fixed gears, I'd rather be on the hard surface. Um, but monitor the ground frequency. If you have a request, wave those guys up and the guy will run up to your cockpit and talk to you. Now, parking. If you have a home-built parking sign, you will be directed to Velocity Row. You don't have to worry about that. Um, they'll bring you up via that Papa One taxiway at the very end. You'll get to see the Warbirds. Um, you'll get to see the whole show on your way. It's a long taxi. They may allow you to taxi all the way to your spot, as I said. They might not. But um, there will be people there to help you push your plane to your spot. There's always help either from other Velocity pilots or if you need help, catch one of the little guys on the scooter and they will get you help. Um, there are CAP kids and other guys on scooters will come zooming up to your plane. You'll get four or five guys to help you push your plane. Um, never think you have to struggle to do it. Um, Velocity Row. This is where you end up parked. This is what it looks like. It's terrific. Um, from this perspective, the show would be off the frame toward the bottom of the picture with my plane facing the runway uh, 1836 and the show. Right behind us is a giant field filled with RVs. Um, you'll note that right behind my left winglet, we have our very own porta potties. Behind my right winglet, we have a subway that op is open on Saturday and Sunday. They have good breakfast, they have good lunch. Um, if you go further off to the right, uh, or actually in the left in this picture, um, that takes you towards Show Center. There's a cheap place to get burgers if you don't want to wait in line. And there's home built headquarters, which would be toward the left in this picture and toward uh, the flight line. Um, here you're going to see, uh, let's see, is that Patrick? I had somebody tying down, but you'll see we get a whole row of us. This is actually on a Saturday. And so a lot of people do arrive on Saturday. This is where, again, you're going to turn in right here, and then you're going to taxi down and either get to turn around past the, the porta potties or they're going to have the, you shut down here. But as you can see, there's a slope. So this is super easy getting in. Now, once in your spot, tie down and figure out what you want to do. Um, if you want to stay, you don't need a wristband to get in the gate. You're already in the show. They don't check once you're in the show. So you've got a freebie once you got in there. Now, if you're headed somewhere else, say you want to camp or you want to go to the dorms and freshen up or you want to go out and get something to eat outside the show, I would stop at the Home Builders headquarters. It's right uh, near where we park and close to the green wayfinding tower. In other words, if you face the flight line from parking, you look up into your right, you're going to see a giant uh, green tower and a, a little one-story building next to it that says Home Builders HQ. That's where you go to register your plane. Um, you go over there on the back side facing the flight line, and they have a big counter with a bunch of old guys there who, who know every airplane. You go up, you uh, tell them where you parked. Oh, and I should add, um, you're, you will have a row number and a space number. I never, ever remember that, and I just give them something close when I go over there. But um, here, this is in terms of upping your game if you've done this before. Note your row number and your space number and write it down before you go over there. Um, when you go over, uh, you get a bag of goodies, a mug, a prop card to put on if you want to judge or just to put some information on, um, a, a pin saying that you flew in, and a map. Uh, they won't give you any of this stuff unless you do buy your wristbands there. Um, because although you're in and nobody's checking, uh, they want you to, uh, to get your wristbands. Um, it's not a bad thing to do, though, because you skip the main line or the big lines at the main entrance the next day. Now, here's the wayfinding tower. This is what it looks like. Uh, you look up and they got the big green one near us. On the side facing to the left that you can't see is actually a picture of Bill Mulroney's velocity on top. Um, over here on the back side, the flight line would be off to the right with 1836 going this way and 927 going left to right just past us and past Warbirds. So you come around here and you're going to see this. And these guys have everything. They have the stacks of mugs waiting for you. They've got little bags of goodies. And uh, you register your plane. And 
they'll ask you some questions about the details about your engine, your end number, um, how many times you've flown in, that sort of thing. If you've been there before, they already have that information. But you get your stuff, you get your wristbands, and you head out. You head back to your plane, um, and there are welcome wagons. And this is, again, up in your game if you've already done this before. I didn't know about the welcome wagons for the first six or eight times I flew my plane in. And then I think it was Andy Millen or, or yeah, it was Andy Millen who told me about them. And after that, I saw them all the time. They'll have these little cut down vans um, and uh, Volkswagen bugs and things like that. They're not street legal. It's just big benches and storage areas in the back. And if you go over to that Home Builders HQ we just saw, um, on the near left corner, or excuse me, as you face the building from the back, the near right corner um, facing the runway, there's a, a Home Builders HQ uh, um, welcome wagon representative. And you just ask him, and these trucks will pull up. They'll take you back to your plane. They'll load all your bags and all your people, and they'll take you wherever you want to go within the show, all the way to camping to your camping spot, up to the front gate to catch a bus, um, wherever you want to go. And they have a little jar for donations. We always give them something. They even give us free water bottles. Uh, they're just super friendly. This is what they look like. Um, you just this is from the perspective of Velocity Road looking back toward the RVs and the uh, uh, the subway. It's just super easy. You pop in here, they take you wherever you want to go for free. Um, once you're there, uh, what do you plan on doing? Well, generally we get to the show when it opens at seven and just about everybody with a Velocity uh, gets there pretty early. We take the covers off and lay them out to dry. We squeegee off the dew and the dirt as I described. The chairs come out. Everybody get, gathers in groups, starts talking, and the day begins. Um, now, the Velocity booth, this is an amendment. Um, the Velocity booth has always been just inside and to the left of the main gate. When you're coming in from outside, the main gate has the uh, two concrete B-17 engines um, on the gates and a big sign. And then you go to the left, and there's a big place to get your, uh, your passes and wristbands. Um, Velocity has always been just to the left near an airplane on a stick, they have a little uh, uh, twin star, uh, light twin on a stick mounted about 20 feet high and Velocity was next to it. They didn't get their booth this year. Um, and they, they met, managed to, I think, well, anyway, they're working on sharing space with uh, Delta Hawk, which is gonna have uh, a twin there. And they're probably about a hundred yards further along. So if you just go in the gate, stay along the left side and walk for 150 yards, it's on the left. Sounds like a long time, but um, this that's close in Oshkosh terms. There are a bazillion food options there. Uh, there are several food courts. Uh, there are little uh, one-off places. Um, if you're looking for the, the thing that's not on the, the usual, usual list, before you come in, uh, there's a, I think it's Holy Redeemer Church, but they have a little white building outside the gate that sells terrific cinnamon rolls, orange juice, and coffee. That's a good option before you come into the gate. Now, let's get our bearings. So again, I'm gonna do this again just because I think it helps. Um, this would be down and to the right off the diagram. If you were coming in on runway 27, you'd come in, you'd go up the far side of the highway, the gravel pit would be on your left, you cheat it out a little bit, you get down to the end and they're gonna tell you which dock to land on, you land, and probably out to the end of the runway unless they tell you to turn off here. You're gonna taxi back this taxiway all the way back to the end. Flagmen are gonna make you stop here and then they'll tell you cross runway 27 and more flagmen will direct you up and you're gonna turn right again and they're gonna bring you down this way past the warbirds. You're gonna turn right on taxiway P1 and you're gonna park right over in here. Again, there's the Home Builders HQ right behind us or close to flight line and the RVs are gonna be here and we're parked right in that area. Now, if you were landing on runway 36, you're gonna come down here from Fisk. You've made your right turn after you rock your wings you turn your left, you land, they'll tell you which taxiway to get off. They'll taxi you down with the show on your left and all the people sitting in their chairs watching you. You come down to put taxiway P1, turn left. There's a guy on a scooter who will turn you into your parking and bring you to your space. Um, runway 9, super, super easy. You come down, they're going to tell you to turn off. They'll bring you over back to P1 and into our parking space. Now, once in the show, if you... If you face the runway, you've got the wayfinding towers to always tell you where you're going. Um, right down here is Boeing Plaza. That's where the heavy iron is. The big bombers, the tankers, uh, the fighters, things like that are gonna be parked here. 
Um, if you keep going down a little bit, you're going to find vintage and antique. Um, you're going to find um, the ultralights, Paradise City down here with the power parachutes, the ultralights, the stoles. It's really neat, and they're flying all day, and it's, it's pretty cool to watch. They have a tram that runs up and down this main drag. You can hop on and off wherever you want. They have a tram that leads to the campground, which is way off here to the right in Camp Scholar. Um, the fly market is over on this side. So you come over here and you could buy basically anything you can think of. The exhibit buildings are in the center. So that if you either walk over or take the tram down the main drag here, which is, this is all parking for um, home builds along here. And between the exhibit buildings and all the food and everything else, they have one main drag with trams going up and down it and just throngs of people. Then Boeing Plaza, then the four giant white exhibit buildings um, have anything you can imagine related to aviation. Celebration Way is the main drag that goes up the center of the air show from Boeing, which is kind of show center, to the main gate. So when you come in on the first day, you're gonna to come to the main gate, you go down the main drag, if you, uh, if you wanted to see um, the Velocity booth, it's going to be down here somewhere. And you could continue down that walk diagonally and come over, look for the green wayfinding tower. That leads you to your plane. You can see it way from out there. Um, there's plenty of stuff to do everywhere. You will never see everything in your first trip. Um, again, here's a picture of what it looks like every morning. You're going to have to clean this off your plane every day, but it's, it's your free hose down. You'll keep your plane nice and clear. Now, Things to do. Uh, you've got your airplane at Oshkosh, you've parked. Uh, a couple things to bear in mind that we didn't think of the first time we flew in. Uh, this is your locker. This is your storage unit right in the middle of Oshkosh. So you don't have to drag your backpack in and out every day. Um, we put the cover on. I don't even lock my plane. I just close the doors and I put the cover on. Um, you can leave your jackets in there. You can leave your stuff in there. We certainly leave the chairs in there and never bring them home during the show. Um, we typically go in, get the plane ready to show in the morning, um, all cleaned up, cover off, ready to let people look at it. If you have your doors open, expect people to come up and poke their heads in and uh, ask you questions. If people are all around asking you questions and your wife or significant other is saying, look, I really want to walk around, I know you enjoy this, close your doors. That's kind of the signal that you're going to be heading out and you'll be back in a while. Um, walking the flight line is a blast. Um, the warbirds are tremendous. The exhibit buildings open on Monday morning. Um, again, anything you can imagine. There are groups of people under all the wings. Um, you can stop by other Velocity folks. Um, when I say a lot of people are going to stop by your plane, as long as you are at your plane, people are going to be coming up asking to look at it, asking you questions about it. So if you want to leave, again, just close the doors. Um, some things that I would hate to miss, Wednesday is the night air show. There's also one for the first time on Saturday night, a second night air show. It is spectacular. It's nice and cool. The fireworks are unbelievable, and they have the world's largest wall of flame. They have a crew that comes out on the far side of runway uh, 1836. They put up a mile-long section of um, barrels of gasoline and dynamite. What could go wrong? And they put up a huge wall of flame. The fireworks are tremendous set to music. There are aircraft with lights and pyrotechnics. Again, helicopters and aircraft spewing township-level fireworks. What could go wrong, as Brett would say? Um, but it's it's thing that you don't want to miss. Wednesday night, we're going to be having uh, the Velocity Dinner at the uh, the Beer Moon. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But this is typical. Just hanging out by your plane in, in the chairs you remember to bring. People are going to stop by, throw their chairs down, sit on the ground. It's awesome. Renee is your guide to the Beer Moon. That's what it looks like. And this is a funny perspective, but it's a giant illuminated balloon that hangs over this tent that sells beer. That's where we're going to have our... Uh, uh, dinner. Um, this is the Sunday uh, Runway 27 Landing Review Board. Again, this is all Velocity people hanging out there by the VOR and the green dot. Um, it's just a blast watching thousands of aircraft, one every few seconds landing on the runway. There's uh, Scott Swing. And there's a the green dot. So again, you'll be that close to it. You'll actually see the green color flash off the bottoms of the airplanes as they land and, and fly over it. Um, now, here's an important point, fuel. If you're going to be leaving on Wednesday, don't wait till Wednesday to try and get fuel. There can be delays of up to days getting your fuel, and it varies year to year. But you can get a green prop card that you put on that says you want fuel, and you write down how much, and you put some information on there. They will bill you later for it. 
But if you see the fuel truck and you're near your plane, flag him down. Get it while you can. Um, if you wait to the last minute, I know I had to send my wife running after the truck one time. Um, so now we're at the end of the show. You've gotten to whatever day you want to go, and it's time for your briefing uh, and your departure. So get your briefing. There will be guys walking around doing briefings. There's a place you can go to get briefings. Um, there, there isn't much to it, really. I'll explain what they're going to tell you. Um, but you're going to monitor the departure at ASN 12175 before you start up, and what they're going to tell you is that you're going to taxi down that big, long taxiway to the departure end of uh, runway 3 sex. Three six. Um, now you got to push your plane up to the taxiway. You're never going to be allowed to start up in Velocity Row or near. So um, again, if you need help, um, ask us. Any of the other Velocity guys will help you, and you can ask a guy on a scooter, and people will magically appear to help you pull it up. When you get up there, make sure you're ready to go. The scooter or flagman is going to be there to clear you out onto the taxiway. When they tell you to go, they're going to want you to go right now. So be ready to start up. Um, as you're sitting there, it's not a terrible wait because um, Mustang after Mustang after Lightning, uh, World War II fighters are going to be taxiing by 10 feet from you, like really good close-up view and sound. Um, don't forget to put your sign in the window. You either have a VFR or IFR departure sign. That will tell them where to direct you. And stay tuned into the ground frequency after you get the AIDS. And it's posted. And it's in the NOTAM. For instance, here's Andy Millen getting a, a departure briefing. This is what the dudes look like, and they'll, they'll give you uh, a little sheet telling you what to do. So after that, you're going to pull your plane up. This is what it looks like looking back at the parking area, uh, back and right there. Um, so we pulled out, and we just pull it that far up, maybe 50 yards, and you stop at the little uh, line across the uh, edge of the taxiway. And at this point, we are ready to go. I got one chalk in. I've got everything ready to go, passengers in with the headsets on. Again, Mustang's taxiing by, but we're good to go. And now you taxi out to the main runway. You turn right. There are flagmen directing you. They'll direct your taxi to the very end of the runway with the show on your right. You're going to go the whole way. And at the end is a moo cow. Uh, it's a mobile plywood crappy command center with a bunch of FAA types who are going to direct you onto the runway and clear you for departure. This is the view as you turn right, and now you're going to do that whole mile-plus long taxiway down to the end. With your VFR, actually, there's your VFR sign laid on the glare shield. That'll get you down there. Um, that's the view looking back as you get near the end. And here's the view as you get to the end. Um, you're going to come down here. You're going to wait. As you get near the end, you're going to stop in traffic. Turn 45 degrees to the right or left and do your run-up. Be ready to go when you get down here. That's not the place to do the run-up. Before you get to the end of the taxiway, be run up and ready to go. Because when you get down there, they're going to say, um, Easy type, uh, line up and wait on runway 36 left, left side of the runway. They might even put somebody on the other side of the runway. And then they'll say clear for departure. So departure times. If you try and depart at a peak time, this is what you're going to get. I did this. That's me right in the middle. And all my cylinder head temperatures and oil temperature were near red line. I had a 40-minute taxi down that empty taxiway I just showed you. And departure times can be right before the air show starts. They can be right at the end of the day before the airport closes. You'll, you'll see when it builds up during the show. Don't do this, or you're going to have to worry about your temperatures. Um, now, it's going to be in your departure briefing, but all you do is after takeoff, you turn right before you get to the tower, maintain a heading of 150 degrees, and re remain below 1,300 feet until you're clear of the Oshkosh Airport airspace. There's, this is all set forth in the departure notum for you in excruciating detail. So, again, it's super easy. Now, here's a diagram. Again, you're going to take off, you're going to turn right, and you got to stay clear, and you got to go out of the area before you climb out. Typically, for me, I'm getting out on that heading 150 degrees. I get down here. Once I'm over the coast, that's when I climb up. Um, this is the view after you make that right turn. This is 150 degree heading on departure immediately after departing the airport. There's the tower. So again, our parking is down here. You're going to taxi down that whole huge taxiway to the very end. You're going to turn, take off, and turn right before the tower. Head out at 150 degrees until you leave the area. And that's it. Um, so at this point, I'd like to uh, see if anybody has any questions. We're exactly one hour, as far as I can tell. Mark, uh, Bob here. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, if it is control tower the week before the No. Uh, 
not the whole week. Um, on I think it starts on fr Friday, where they have the the arrival procedure in effect. So if you came out on say a Monday a week before the show, it's just a regular airport, uncontrolled. Uh, no, there's still a control tower at Oshkosh, but you're not oh, doing the Fisk approach with Fisk controllers. Okay, but there is a there is ATC at at Oshkosh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And they're they're probably the most competent, friendly guys you'll ever run across. They compete throughout the nation for spots to get on uh, that tower uh, crew and to get the very coveted uh, Oshkosh uh, ATC shirts. Yeah, it's Monty here. I think that Oshkosh is class the airspace when it's not the air show. Right. Uh, good job, Mark. Very good, oh, good. job. I hope that's helpful to people. I think... You know, I, I really would like to impress on everyone, this is not hard to do. Um, you just need to prep for it. Uh, it's actually, I, I landed at West Palm Beach and thought that was harder to sequence in with that jet traffic than it was to land at Oshkosh. Um, these guys are out there with nothing but a desire to help you. And it's a finely oiled machine start to finish. I mean, just when you watch 300,000 people drive into and out of the airport without a delay, I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of people watching the night fireworks show, then you get in your car and you just drive out. That doesn't happen in my township. Um, I'm trapped in the parking lot for a half an hour trying to get out, but everything is just so honed to, to perfection. It all just works. And I don't think there's a bad option in terms of what housing you do, where you stay. You're going to have a great time either way. Um, and if you haven't been there before, it's bigger than you can possibly imagine and better than you can possibly imagine. If you have been there before, I think you're going to find something new about flying your velocity in if you haven't done that. Um, in terms of just being there with your plane, um, showing it off, frankly, is awesome um, because you're, nobody gets in very much appreciation during the building years. You, you're just that idiot building an airplane. And after you finish it, um, yeah, you get attention when you land at airports and such, but people will go crazy over your plane. Lots of fun. Oh, there it is. I'll go with the authority. Exactly right. And sometime you have to ask Brett his Oshkosh VFR, low VFR arrival story. Uh, it's probably one of the best stories I've ever heard from Dwayne. Um, and I've stopped screen sharing, so let me just show you. Here's the little mug you get. And here's another tip. Um, when it's time to leave, I didn't mention this. So what do you do? How do you get to your airplane and, and what do you do then? Well, you go to the main entrance and you turn left and it says guest services. And there's a separate counter. You go over there and you tell them, and you're with your bags, et cetera. You tell them, we're departing. And they'll give you this. It's a little VFR departure card that supposedly gives you 45 minutes. Basically, it gets you through the gate. No one's ever going to check. On the day you leave, go in and get one of these. Don't buy a wristband. Even if you're going to stay till afternoon, get this little card and go in there. And that'll get you in. Um, in terms of the signs, again, I made this. This is what gets you into Velocity Row. This is what gets you out via far. You just hold it up. Um, in terms of the cards, this is what we had made up. I hope you can see it. We have the plane. Saturday, and back, just contact information. If you so those are handy to have. And the notum, again, I haven't tabbed it yet, but I have this on my lap when I land. Anybody else have any questions about anything or anything that we missed that you think would be helpful to folks? Yeah. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Hey, uh, I've been coming in on Mondays, uh, and I find it to be very light traffic. 
I've never had to go around. What time do you come in? In a hold. Uh, it's been really good. I've been, most of the time, I'm not even following anybody in. What time do you come in? Uh, mid to late morning. Yeah, you know what? That's great. Um, I've had the opposite experience a couple times, and I've had it the other way sometimes. I can't figure out a rhyme or reason to it um, other than weather. Sometimes I find that if there's been a, a, a front or something that keeps people out, you get this back pressure build up and everybody floods in. Yeah. Or if you have yeah. bad weather coming and you're close, other people are saying, no, no mouse, I'll just wait till tomorrow. You can go in and it's empty. So there are a lot of different factors. And you're right. You could go a couple of years and not have a problem. But um, I avoid Monday morning um, because we did it one or two years and it was pandemonium. <laughs> okay. Anyways, hey, uh, I also drive the welcome wagon. And you guys, when you register, the welcome uh, wagon crew is right next to that registration yes. booth. Stop in. They've got a phone number. So you don't have to go over there. You can call the phone number, tell them what row you're in. They'll come out. That's a good point. Right there at the plane. I've always just walked over because it's, what do you think, 100 yards? Oh, yeah, yeah. It is. Close. Yeah, but uh, you're right. Um, if you look it up on uh, AirVenture, and I could probably even try and post it later, but if you call them, they'll come right to your spot. You don't have to even move your butt away from your plane. Yep. 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 That's a good point. Okay. Monty again here. Yeah. Mark, you can hear. Yes. What happens, Mark, if you want to take someone for a ride halfway through the show? I don't um, through the air show, but you're going to, you're, you're there, all parked. Now you want to just go out for two hours. Come back you're going to have to fly the approach again. There's nothing that yes. says you can't leave and come back. Andy is, I know, uh, left. He's come in consecutive days. Come in, left after part of the day, come back in for part of the day and left. Um, the Velocity uh, factory guys typically do demo flights, but they have their planes staged down by the flight line when they do that, or they do it sometimes from Fond du Lac. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's no reason that you can't do that, but it might be a hassle. I mean, it might be a while getting back in. and. Um, I don't know what the deal is for parking. I, I suppose no one's going to take your parking spot from uh, just leave your tie downs there, you know? <laughs> yeah, the thought I was wondering about getting the same spot. So I've flown yeah. in a few times, but always in a Piper Warrior. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so this might be the first year. Andy's the only guy I've, I've ever actually personally observed going in and out the same day because most of us go in and stay for a period of days. And he yeah. lives just across the lake. But... It didn't look to be a hassle. Uh, when he wanted to go, he did what we described. He pulled the plane up and leave. And huh. Come back in. They don't necessarily know that you've been there before anyway. They're just going to do automatically what we described. Yeah. And then the other thing I've done is stay at um, Sheboygan. That way you get to fly in four times for the one Oscars. Okay. So that's a bit of fun. And cheaper um, accommodation, probably. Yes. Yeah, good. yeah, sure. I've never done it just because once I'm there, I like to just be there and soak it all up. Yep. Um, we have um, the Velocity pilots get together multiple times throughout the week. We have the Velocity dinner, sure, but there's a Fox River Brewing Company, and if you've seen any of our pictures, it's on the Fox River, and they're the most stunning sunset views you've ever seen. And great food and great company. We all sit together. And there's another restaurant called Mahoney's we all go to together with groups of 20 or plus people. We go to uh, a really crappy college bar at the UW Oshkosh, Achilles. <laughs> I've got this shirt. Um, we go there, and it's picnic tables with pilots from all over the world sitting out under an awning. It's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, good. I'll mute back again until uh, I think of something else. All right. Anybody else? Well, great. I'm, I hope everybody enjoyed this. I hope it was some use to you. Um, We'll make sure it gets up on the website so you can uh, follow it up again if you want to repeat anything. Certainly, if anybody wants to email me with any questions, I'll be happy to do my best to answer. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible at Oshkosh. Thanks. Mark, thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I appreciate all the effort that went into it. And I uh, hope that we get a, a big group at Oshkosh this year. Uh, also, a special thanks to Andy Millen for organizing this and uh, Brett Farrell, who is recording it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah. Great summer. Thank you, Mark. Mark. Good. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.